our modern day-to-day -day lives are made of countless interactions with the objects we encounter. From the tiniest particles to the biggest structures. Join us as we explore the inside workings of the world around us. This is Inside Things. Color Blindness Does a colorblind person see the world in black, white, and gray? The answer is no. Color blindness means not seeing the colors red, green, or blue, or a combination of these in the normal way people do. It's only rare that a colorblind person sees absolutely no color. Color blindness is a color vision problem. It is mostly inherited or genetic and is a condition present at birth. Usually, the condition stays the same throughout a person's lifetime. It won't improve or worsen. What happens when a person is colorblind? Let's take a look at how the eye processes color. The eye has two light-sensitive cells, the rods and the cones. Both are found in the retina, a layer at the back of the eye that processes the images. The rods work in low-light settings to help night vision, while the cones work in daylight and are responsible for color discrimination. A normal person usually has three types of cone cells in the eye. Each type senses a red, green, or a blue light. When you look at an object, light from it enters your eye and stimulates the cone cells. Then, your brain processes the signals from the cone cells so that you can identify the colors of the object. Now, the three cones always work together for you to be able to see an entire spectrum of colors. Such as when the red and blue cones are simulated, together, you'll see purple. This is how you are able to perceive color. When a person is inherently colorblind, it means that one of the cone cells in his or her eye isn't functioning properly. The effect would either be not being able to see one of the three basic colors or seeing a different shade of that color or a different color entirely. The most common type is the red-green color blindness, where the person sees the red and green as the same color. In the rare cases that color blindness has been developed, instead of inherited, the most common causes are aging, eye problems, eye injury, or a side effect from certain medicines. GPS The GPS, or the Global Positioning System, is a space-based network that provides information on location and time anywhere on or near the Earth. This system was originally developed by the government of the United States for military navigation purposes. But today, anyone with a GPS device can actually access and make use of it. How does the GPS function? The GPS has three major parts. First is the network of satellite that consists of about 30 satellites orbiting the Earth at an altitude of 12,427.42 miles or 20,000 kilometers. Second is the Master Control Station, plus four control monitoring stations, specifically in Hawaii, Ascension Islands, Jaga Garcia, and Kawahale. And lastly, a GPS receiver or device like in your mobile phone or cars. When you stand at any place on the planet, at least four GPS satellites should be detected by your GPS device at any time. Each satellite 
can send information about its position and the current time at regular intervals via signals that travel at the speed of light. Your GPS device will intercept these signals and then calculate how far each satellite is and how long it took for the messages to arrive. Once your device has gotten the info on how far away at least three of the GPS satellites are, it can then already identify your location through the process of trilateration. How does trilateration work? Simple. Again, imagine yourself standing at any place on the planet. Three GPS satellites are above you. Each satellite is responsible for a certain radius or locations within a circle. So all the three satellites have their circles. And at one point, there is an intersection among the three. This is where your location may be identified. The GPS receiver uses overlapping spheres to determine your location. So the calculation of your exact location on the planet is based on your distance from the three satellites. Then comes in a fourth satellite which will only be used to verify the results from the first calculation. If your location, as calculated by the first three satellites, say, satellites A, B, and C, do not match with the calculations of another set, such as satellites A, B, and D, then another combination will be made. Different satellite groups will be tested to pinpoint your location. Tornadoes Tornadoes are extreme effects of supercell thunderstorms. Supercell storms are thunderstorms with powerful updrafts, or the strong upward current or gush of air. Supercell tornadoes are more powerful than those that do not come from supercells. Examples of non-supercell tornadoes are the gust nados and the land sprouts. Gust nados are short-lived low-level swirls of rotating clouds that may result from severe thunderstorms. While land sprouts, or dust tube tornadoes, occur in drier areas with high-based storms and have low-level instability. Now, how exactly do these tornadoes form? Here's a step-by-step -step breakdown. Step 1. All winds, storms, and tornadoes form when the sun heats up the land surface. This is because the heat causes the less heavy air to rise. When this happens, the hot air mixes with the cooler, heavier air above it. Plus, there are also wind shears to help the air set off and rise. Wind shears form when two winds of different levels and speeds above the ground flow together in a location. Step 2. The faster moving wind begins to spin, roll over, and dominate the smaller wind. As this happens, the bundle of winds gathers space and becomes bigger in size. Step 3. You can imagine the wind now as a horizontal wind that's spinning and rolling fast like a cylinder. When these continue to gather space and grow bigger, it becomes more powerful too. It encourages more warm air to join and rise vertically upwards, causing an updraft. Step 4. Because more warm air goes up, the spinning winds mix with more updraft. It continues growing bigger and going faster, increasing momentum. Step 5. At this point, the spinning winds are strong enough that it creates a vortex, or an entire mass of whirling air. This means the wind has gathered enough energy to fuel itself. Step 6. The tornado is now fully formed. When the tornado's pointed part reaches the ground from the cloud, this is the touchdown. Now, it will continue moving in the same direction as the storm winds. Destroying things along its path.
Camouflage Most animals have a natural camouflage for survival skills, helping them find food and protecting them from possible attack. Each animal's camouflaging ways differ with each species. There are two ways in which animals camouflage. First is through biochromes. Biochromes are the natural microscopic pigments in the animal's body that can produce colors chemically. This means they are able to absorb colors of light and reflect these too. So what can be seen is a combination of all the visible light wavelengths that are reflected by the biochromes. The other way is through microscopic physical structures. You can picture these structures like glass prisms. It can refract and scatter visible light so that a certain combination of colors is reflected. Did you know that polar bears actually have black skin? They only appear to be white because of their translucent hairs. So, when light shines on the hairs, the hair strands bend this light and bounces it. Some of this light reaches the skin's surface, while some are deflected back out, thus producing the white color. Meanwhile, for some animals, such as reptiles, amphibians, and fish with green coloration, two types of colorations are combined. These kinds of animals have a layer of skin with yellow pigments, plus a layer of skin that's able to scatter light and reflect a blue color. Together, the two layers of skin make them appear green in color. Coloration depends on the animal's physiology. For most mammals, camouflage coloration happens in its fur, because this is the outermost layer of their bodies. For reptiles, amphibians, and fish, it's in the scales, feathers for birds, and the exoskeleton for insects. The texture and structure of the animal also contributes to its camouflaging. Examples are the squirrel's fur, which are rough and even to replicate the tree bark's texture, and insects which have shells similar to the smooth textures of leaves. The two types of coloration, physical and chemical, are passed on through species genetically. Every species are able to develop their camouflaging abilities as they live through natural selection. To explain this further, when an animal's color matches its surroundings, it is able to avoid attacks, thus live longer. It follows that this animal will be able to produce offspring, and the cycle continues. Lungs Every day, we breathe. But have you ever stopped to think about how our lungs actually work so we can breathe? Did you know that every day you can actually breathe 20 times a minute? Your respiratory system is responsible for this. With every breath, your lungs expand and contract to take in oxygen into the body and take out its waste product, which is carbon dioxide. When you inhale air into your nose or mouth, it travels down the back of your throat and then into your windpipe which is called trachea. The trachea divides the air into passages called bronchial tubes. These need to be always open as you inhale and exhale, and free from inflammation or swelling and excess amounts of mucus. As the air, via the bronchial tubes, passes through the lungs, they then divide into smaller air passages called bronchioles. At the end of the bronchioles are tiny balloon-like air sacs called alveoli. Your body has over 300 million alveoli. Now, the alveoli are surrounded by lots of tiny blood vessels called capillaries. This is where the oxygen from the inhaled air passes through the alveoli walls and goes to the blood. Once oxygen is absorbed into the blood, it leaves the lungs and goes to your heart. The heart will pump it throughout your body, providing oxygen to the cells of your tissues and organs. When the cells use the oxygen, it gives off carbon dioxide. 
which is absorbed into the blood. So, the blood carries the carbon dioxide back to the lungs, which will remove it from the body when you exhale. Helping out the lungs in the breathing process is the diaphragm. It is a large, dome-shaped muzzle located under the lungs. When you inhale, the diaphragm contracts downward, creating a vacuum that causes a rush of fresh air into the lungs. And when you exhale, the diaphragm relaxes upward, pushing the lungs to deflate and release carbon dioxide. Hairs and mucus in your air passages also have helpful roles in the breathing process. Cilia, or the microscopic hairs along your air passage, move in a sweeping motion to keep the air passages clean. Harmful substances like pollution or cigarette smoke may impair the cilia. Meanwhile, the mucus keeps the air passages moist and prevents dust, bacteria, and other viruses from entering the lungs. Green Screens The green screen is responsible for many amazing video effects and technology. The basic idea is superimposing subjects into virtual backgrounds. You take a main character from the real world and drop him or her into an entirely digital environment. But how? The green screen uses chroma key or color keying. Keying refers to the process of isolating a single color or brightness value in an electronic image. Then, a software makes it transparent so that other images such as a background can show through the main image. Luminance keying or luma keying keys out a brightness value or range such as black or white. Luminance keys are usually used when applying mats. Color keying or chroma keying meanwhile makes use of a specific color to remove. It is the process where a specific color element or chroma is removed from a video scene and replaced or keyed with a different element. In other words, it's removing a background and replacing it with another. The process is most commonly used in news reporting, where the news anchor has to stand in front of a virtual map that shows locations of possible storms and such. In reality, the news anchor is simply standing against a green screen. It's actually possible to key out any color, red, yellow, blue, pink, and yes, green. But why is green the most commonly used? Contrast is the main reason. Because when you have to isolate one area from its surroundings, the background color must be distinctly different. And people rarely wear the color green as compared to other colors. Any part of the talent's clothing that may match the background closely will also key out. Thus also including a part of your subjects with the background. Yellow and red are also near people's skin tones. So, the talent's background may be mixed with his or her skin. Now, lighting is key to make chroma keying work well. The background should be lit very brightly, while the talent should be subject under dim light. This is to contrast the two layers, making it easier to separate them. Tattoo Removal How are tattoos removed via laser? To know this, we should understand how a person gets inked first. Tattoos usually are made of compounds from heavy metals such as lead, copper, manganese, and even mercury. 
it's the metals in the ink that actually gives tattoos their permanency. At the same time, however, these may also be a cause of allergic reactions for some. Once the needle deposits tattoo ink deep onto the skin, the immune system recognizes these particles as foreign intruders. And as a natural defense, dispatches white blood cells to surround them. The white blood cells capture small ink particles, turning these over to the liver in order to be excreted from the body. But because the ink particles are most often a lot larger than the white blood cells, the permanent tattoos only fade over a long time, but not really disappearing naturally. Now, to erase a tattoo, a laser is needed to really break up the permanent ink particles. Tattoo removal lasers are ultra-short pulse lasers. These are extremely hot and function in a very narrow frequency and are very fast too. Some lasers can work as quickly on a scale of picoseconds or a trillionth of a second. But the super fast speed is necessary, or rather, the most important element in cracking the ink particles apart. First, heat is used to make the ink particles expand due to thermal expansion. But the zap has to be really quick enough so that half of the ink particle remains cool. These opposing forces of hot and cool areas of the particle are what rips it apart. This process is called photothermolysis. Basically, what it does is break down the permanent ink particles into smaller sizes, enough for white blood cells to absorb, and then carry to the liver. Narrating the process may make it sound simple and easy, but tattoo removal can be very costly not to mention painful, and it will take several sessions of laser treatments. There you have it, another episode down the drain. Still, there are countless more things to explore. Join us next time as we look and know more about the world around us. See you next time on Inside Things.